Uh, I am going to turn the floor over to Emily Grass. Uh, I want to thank her and Ian Ferguson um, for helping to put this together, uh, along with Toby, uh, who helped uh, select the articles and the topic. So thank you guys. Uh, Emily, if you want to tell us a little bit about the topic and how you guys picked the articles, that would be great. Sure. Hey guys. Um, so we had kind of got this task from um, Emily Harkins, kind of turned us over for the critical care interest group and um, kind of picking articles that we were interested in for the critical care focused journal club. Um, and thanks to Ian and thanks to Dr. Lynch as well for help, helping us kind of pick um, the tar the articles that we wanted to do. Um, so it kind of, the idea for me kind of came out of a couple of different things. One, um, being a rising to going into third year um, and kind of thinking about the types of patients that come into TCC that we'll now be leading um, that we haven't before and a common one is cardiac arrest um, and kind of thinking what is the data behind um, things that we can do to help these patients not only survive but have a good outcome and I think that kind of looking at the literature and doing a review of the literature um, it was interesting to see a shift towards neurological outcomes being the primary end goal um, and outcome that we're concerned about versus ROSC um, or survival to hospital admission or survival to hospital discharge. Because um, if we're not helping patients survive with good neurological outcomes, then um, maybe it's not necessarily a, a good outcome just to be alive, um, but we want to be alive and able to function. Um, so that was kind of one thing. And the second thing is I'm currently in the neuro ICU um, up on 94 and we have so many patients that we're just doing prognostication on um, post-cardiac arrest and, and the majority of them are not having good outcomes. And so that just kind of fueled the fire as well to um, take a look at the data and see if there was anything new um, out there that we could find of things that we can modify or pay attention to um, while we're um, dealing with patients in the ED that could affect them long-term. So. Um, kind of looking at the, the papers that we chose, the first paper um, was duration of CPR. So can we look at how long this patient has been undergoing CPR and kind of use the data to help guide us whether or not we should continue forward or whether or not we should call the code. Um, and then other things were um, timing to first dose of epinephrine, um, which is the second year paper that we'll talk about. Um, and then also an interesting one, the third year paper is kind of interesting. I thought um, the looking at um, hyperoxygenation and that that might have um, bad outcomes of neurological outcomes associated with it. So things we can do with our ventilator management after we get ROSC to make sure that we're um, taking care of those patients and giving them the best chance. And then I thought the, the last paper, which is the meta-analysis, looking at all of the different um, vasopressors that we use, trying to help us kind of guide our management and the different medications that we're giving the patients, once again, kind of focused on the same outcome. So hopefully it's a good conversation and it can help, especially the rising twos, um, have some good insight going into third year. All right, excellent. Thanks, Emily. Uh, and thanks again to Ian Ferguson and Dr. Lynch for helping to put this together as well. Uh, well, let's go ahead and get started with the first year paper. Who is going to be presenting that one? Interns? Yes, it is me, Miros. Perfect. All right, Miros, you're on. All right. So uh, my paper is um, a cohort study. It's titled Relationship Between the Duration of Cardiopulmonary Resuscitation and Favorable Neurological Outcomes After Out-of-Hospital Cardiac Arrest, um, a Prospective Nationwide Population-Based Cohort Study. It was authored by Yoshikazu Gocho and some associates in, from university uh, in Japan. Um, and uh, it was published in 2016 in the Journal of the American Heart Association. So just to kind of go over their objectives and some of the paper and the method and all that. So kind of the primary objectives that they were looking at is to determine the relationship between the duration of the pre-hospital CPR that was started by EMS and the um, favorable neurological outcomes and kind of how that looked like in terms of the duration. Um, they were also looking at the initial rhythm um, that was noted by EMS at the outside hospital cardiac arrest and, um, and then comparing that with the CPR duration and trying to determine 
how the length that would that would give them the best percentage of survivors. Um, and so, let me see here. Um, kind of the methods that they used, again, this is a prospective observational cohort study. It was conducted over two year period in 2011 and 2012 in Japan. Um, they were looking specifically at the outside hospital um, cardiac arrest and they wanted to narrow it down to those um, specifically with cardiogenic like origin or cause. And so that was determined by either the physician at the hospital or by EMS personnel. Um, and in terms of what they were, I guess the setting and the, their data collection. So Japan has a fire and disaster management agency that supervises kind of nationwide EMS system. And so they were, they started in 2005, kind of a database, prospective like database looking at um, outside hospital cardiac arrest and those that received um, care by EMS. And so they took their data from, you know, 2011, 2012, using that database. Um, so they supervised kind of nationwide EMS system, but the local systems were kind of run by the local fire stations. Um, and to kind of go with that, so all the EMS personnel that um, were kind of involved in this data did, uh, had been trained in Japanese um, CPR guidelines that were established in 2010. And, um, and what was interesting to me is that the EMS personnel in Japan are legally prohibited from um, stopping any type of resuscitation in the field. So if they started any type of CPR, they needed to continue all the way until they got into the hospital setting unless there was like specific criteria um, that the patient uh, met, meaning that they were decapitated or they were, had already started to decompose or had rigor mortis or things like that. Um, and this database was developed again by the kind of the nationwide agency, but it was anonymous and open for public use as well. Um, and some of the variables that they included in the database is the sex, age, etiology of the arrest, if there were any witnesses to the arrest, any bystanders, if any bystanders initiated CPR, um, and the duration of CPR, specifically EMS got there. They didn't account for the time that if any like bystander CPR um, had started anything, it was uh, specifically EMS starting the CPR and then their time to ROSC um, and then looked at their one month survival and one month neurological outcomes, which they used um, a kind of a scale that I think is pretty common for to look at neurological outcomes in cardiac arrest called the cerebral performance category scale. Um, and that's kind of like a questionnaire that the physician at whoever attending or physician was in charge at the time of the patient at that one month would, would do that questionnaire and determine the scale of the neurological like function. One being good cerebral performance, five being basically brain death. Um, so they, the study specifically, were looking at those that qualified or were um, classified in the category one or two, two being moderate um, cerebral disability. Um, let me see here. Yes. So the study endpoints, the primary endpoint that they were looking at was the favorable neurological outcomes at that one month, one month period. Um, and that was, um, again, like I mentioned, they were classified as either uh, one or two. Um, and then the secondary endpoint was one month, their survival at the one month period after the cardiac uh, arrest at, outside of the hospital. So for the statistical analysis, um, so they further, they had, you know, they were looking at those that had cardiac arrest outside the hospital, those that, um, were able to get ROSC before the hospital, EMS was able to get ROSC, and then that they were either survived at one month, and then they further classified their cohorts or their groupings by um, the initial cardiac rhythm that they were found to be in by EMS. So that was um, either 
ventricular fib fibrillation or pulseless, pulseless VT were in one group. Um, PEA was in another group and asystole was in the third group. And so they had kind of a lot of variables that they were looking at in terms of like the group characteristics. And so there was, and there was other information that was missing, like, you know, patient comorbidities and, and what had happened in that hospital stay during that month. So there was some uh, quite a few tests and statistical tests that were done to kind of uh, be able to compare these these groups adequately. Um, let me see here. And I just want to make sure I'm getting everything. Okay. So in terms of the results, uh, again, this was a two-year study period. Overall, they had, what they're initially looking at, there was uh, 250, just over 254,000 uh, patients that qualified, and then due to the exclusion criteria, they narrowed it down to 17,238 um, patients. And so some of those exclusion criteria was that either resuscitation was not initiated out in the field, if they were less than 18 years old, if their initial cardiac rhythm was unknown or just not documented, if they did not um, get ROSC, pre-hospital ROSC, which was the majority of those that excluded up to like, I think they said like 90%, they were not able to obtain ROSC pre in the pre-hospital setting. And then if they had like unknown variables and incomplete variables, then they were excluded as well. Um, and so, they had like all the, so just for, I guess, all groups involved, like the just over 17,000 patients, um, the average or the median age was 74. Um, there was the predominance of males at 62%. Um, their, uh, the, I guess, median CPR duration was 14 minutes. Um, and there was 72% of them were witnessed arrest, but 45% had a bystander that initiated CPR um, and kind of these other variables. And then they kind of broke it down as well, looking at the, the three initial cardiac groups. So V, Fib, and uh, pulseless VT, PA, and asystole. And what they found is that in looking at the uh, V, Fib, and pulseless VT groups, there was statistical um, differences when compared to the other two groups in terms of age. So they were significantly younger at 75 years of age, and they, um, a higher percentage of them were male, and a higher percentage of that group also had witness of this arrest um, and had CPR initiated by bet bystanders and had a cardiac, like known cardiac cause that was established for that, um, and shorter duration of the. Um, CPR to get ROS. So on average, it was 10 minutes for that group. For the PA group, it was average 14 minutes. And for the asystole group, it was average like 19 minutes over those groups. Mm -hmm. And then overall, um, in figure two, if you're looking at it, um, they're just for overall the not within the cardiac, you know, initial cardiac groups, but just overall those that were able to obtain ROSC, there were 36.8% that had survived that one month to that one month kind of marker. And 21.8% of those um, overall, like the whole group, had favor the favor favorable neurological outcomes. Um, and then they also broke it down into the cardiac groups. So the BFib and BT um, by far had the best outcomes that they that they saw with 68% of the VFib VT group having survived um, to the one month. The PEA group survived, 30.5% um, uh, 30, 30 survived to the one month. And in the Sicily group, only 15% survived to the one month. And then um, looking at the favorable outcomes, um, being the either one or two classification of the CPC, the VT and VFib group had 52% of them, just over 52% had favorable outcomes. 
the PEA group had 13.7% and ACES Lee with only 4.5%. Um, so significant difference there um, in terms of kind of the, the endpoints that they were looking at within those groups. Um, so they were also looking at um, the duration, like mentioned, duration of the CPR um, and kind of compared it to their one month survivor and um, outcome. So table two is kind of uh, looking at the odds ratio for this um, and kind of breaking it down between um, like five minute intervals, but also just like overall CPR uh, duration. So for the one month survivor, um, survival, overall, it was found that, let me see here. So there was improved or a positive association with a survivor survivorship at one month if they, um, if they achieved DROS within 30 minutes. Um, and then looking at the one month survivor with the favorable neurological outcomes, there was a positive association or a higher degree of, uh, you know, better outcome uh, at the, with the odds ratio if um, they had ROS within 20 minutes. Um, and overall, um, they found or they kind of determined that there was an inverse association between these like outcomes and the duration of that it took for them to get ROS with CPR. Um, let's see here. And then they were looking also at um, just one of the other um, uh, figures here, figure eight, the dynamic probability. So they were also looking at uh, just basic the survivor versus the survivor at one month versus the favorable neurological outcomes and found that of surviving the one month um, decreased significantly after 20 minutes, so um, it, it decreased from 36.8% of the, prob the percent probability um, to 4.6% if that if they required CPR um, to get ROS greater than 20 minutes. And then in terms of the neurological outcomes as well, it was also found to be kind of 20 minutes, but there was, they determined was like the significant um, change in the probability percentage, 21.8%. Um, versus 1.9% uh, after 20 minutes. And then, um, and I think we can go to kind of, they were also looking at the, so the other ones that were looking at the duration um, of the CPR and then they, they further kind of uh, break it down based off of the initial cardiac. Um, rhythms as well. So, um, and table three kind of looks at that more closely, but essentially what they're looking at is that they're, the relationship between the duration of the CPR and the cumulative proportion of one month survivors by, based off of the initial um, cardiac monitoring or cardiac rhythm, excuse me. And so of the patients, of all the patients that they looked at, those that survived um, to one month, 99% of those, or just over 99% of those, um, were able to get ROS within 35 minutes. And so they had the higher, um, I guess, proportional or percentage uh, after that. Like after that, the percentage, the likelihood that you would get favorable outcome would be decreased. Um, the one month favorable outcome for the all patients as well, also found to be like about 35% is where it kind of goes just above the 99 percentile of those that uh, had favorable outcomes. Um, and then also for the BFib, VT, and then the PEA groups, they also had at about 35 minutes had the, um, uh, Excuse me. Yeah, so it, it is is when the percentage increased just above ninety nine percent for those that. Um, sorry, I want to make sure I'm saying it correctly. Yeah, so so those that survived and had those outcomes that they were looking at, 
99% of them had ROSC within 35 minutes overall in all the patients, but also within the VFib, VT group, and the PEA group. The difference that they saw was with the A-Sicily group that 99, uh, where they just went above 99% for those, um, the time for the CPR to ROS increased to 42 minutes. Um, so longer duration um, to get ROS back and still get those, um, those outcomes. So um, kind of they mentioned from what their limitations were, which I agreed with kind of the majority of them is that um, that they were missing a lot of variables in terms of like the patients, like they only had what the database had available to them. So they didn't have any information on like any comorbidities, any past medical history uh, that the patient had. Um, they did not have uh, any information on the duration or quality of the CPR that was done by the bystanders before EMS got there. Um, and they also, um, they didn't mention, yeah, I think they did mention it as well, but there was this whole like month long of, of things that happened either within the hospital or within the patient that interventions that could have been done that we have no idea about um, because they didn't look, I, you know, they didn't have the records at that hospital to see like what had been done to get them to survive to that one month point. Um, and that includes like any like pressors that were given or um, if they had ECMO or anything like that. So they concluded that there was this independently and inversely like inversely association between survivor, like these outcomes that they were looking at survivorship at one month and um, favorable neurological outcomes, like the longer that you required CPR to get ROS, the, the less likelihood that you were going to have these like outcomes that they were looking for, these favorable outcomes that they were looking for. Um, and they determined also kind of their conclusions were that um, the critical pre-hospital CPR duration um, was 35 minutes for those that were in a shockable rhythm like VFib or VT or PEA, and then 42 minutes for those initially in the system. And yeah, so I can continue to the review form. That's right, all right. So just kind of reviewing everything here. Did the study address a clearly focused issue? Um, I think it did. I think that, you know, they were looking at specifically how, you know, they wanted to see these outcomes and their association with the duration of CPR, which they were able to do. Um, and I think that uh, they did mention that there's, there's not really any, you know, the EMS in Japan cannot uh, stop any type of resuscitation. So they don't have any like real guidance as to like how long they should go before they kind of determined that it's kind of futile care. So I think that they were looking at a, a clear issue there. Um, did the authors use appropriate method to answer the question? Um, or is the cohort study a good way to answer this question? I think so. I think that this kind of um, uh, observational prospective cohort study is a good way to kind of look at what we're trying to find here. We're trying to find a specific group of people and then be able to follow them in the their kind of factors that they had, excuse me. Um, so was the cohort recruited in an acceptable way? Um, well, I mean, the cohort that they were looking at were these people that had this cardiac arrest outside the hospital, and then they were able to get, those that were able to get Ross prior to the hospital. So I think that they were looking at the correct database to gather all that. My issue with that was that it seemed like there was, their database was from the national system or the FDMA system, but and then they mentioned that local fire departments were responsible for the local um, EMS system. So it's a little bit unclear to me if, if that nationwide system included all of that or if the local fire department systems did not. I think so, they were just telling us how the information got into the database and it sounds uh -huh. like the local fire stations and, and EMS systems were the ones responsible for collating the data and, and submitting it. Okay, well that makes more sense then, because then I think that yes, 
um, I think it was representative of the population. If, if you know, all these local departments are then fun funneling their information to the whole nationwide database, then I think that, you know, it is pretty uh, representative of the population as a whole if you're looking at nationwide. Um, and then was there uh, something special about the cohort? I, I mean, I think so. I mean, this was a very specific thing that they were looking at. And I think that, you know, they were able to gather that information with this uh, method and the database that they had. It was everybody included who should have been included. Um, and I, I think that that would be yes as well, based off of like what they were trying to, to accomplish with this. Um, was the exposure accurately measured to minimize bias? Um, so I guess the exposure or the trigger would be that, you know, those that had cardiac arrest. Um, and I think that that can be accurately, you know, measured. I don't think there'd be a lot of bias into that. It's based off of like closeness and they have the equipment such as, you know, um, their monitors and their um, cardiac rhythm machines to be able to do that. Um, did they use subjective? or objective measurements. Um, hold on. Um, I think that they were, hold on, outcome, yeah, yeah. So um, I think they're pretty objective. They were looking at, you know, pulselessness, time for uh, CPR. They were looking at the initial rhythms. Um, and then do, let me see. Were all the subjects classified into exposure groups using the same procedure? Um, I think they were then like subclassified into their like initial cardiac rhythm. Um, either those three, VT, VFib, PEA or ACIS. So they, um, they, they don't really go into that, like how specifically that was done. Like if, if there's like a standardized EKG machine that they are hooked up to or a monitor that they're hooked up to, or if this is like a manual, uh, like EKG machine that then the EMS looks at. So um, potentially, I mean, I'm not really sure. They didn't really go into how that was determined. Um, was the outcome accurately measured to minimize bias? So kind of the outcomes that they were looking at specifically were the one month survival and uh, the neurological outcomes at that one month period. Um, and I think, and then I, let me, I guess I can answer some of these. And so was the outcome accurately measured to minimize bias? Did they use subjective or objective measurements? Um, and I think the, I mean, whether they survived at one month is pretty objective. Like they either did or they didn't. Now, what was more subjective to me was their neurological outcome is that they used this like scale that um, was done by whichever attending or, or physician was in charge at the um, at that one month period to determine the neurological function and so I'm sure that there's some like subjectivity to how they're scaling um, the patients but I think overall it was a decent at least there was some systematic way that everybody used to kind of gather that information um has a reliable let me see has a reliable system been established for detecting all the cases i think so i mean it's a pretty large system pretty large database nationwide to be able to kind of determine or collect this information on these people that had cardiac arrest um, were the measurement methods similar in the different groups? So yes, like all the measurements that they had done, either the survivorship at one month, neurological outcomes, those were all um, uh, consistent between the three cardiac rhythm groups. Um, were the subjective and or outcome assessors blinded to exposure? No, there was no blinding um, in, this, in this kind of setup. And, um, and then the patients, there was like the informed consent was waived. So I don't you know if they knew that they were a part of the study, to be honest, because um, this was just database, but um, subject, there was no blinding there either. Um, and I like that the outcomes were more like patient-centered outcomes rather than just like 
um, like either, you know, there's your survival at one month and then something that we actually care about, like their neurological outcome that makes a difference as to like, <clears throat> should we, should we not continue to, to try to do this? Um, have the authors identified all important confounding factors and have they taken account of the confounding factors in the design? So they do mention, uh, they, they do make sure to kind of point out that they are missing a lot of like variables, including that whole time period between the Ross and that month long period, whether they were in the hospital or not, and like what kind of interventions were done with that. They do mention that there were differences within the initial cardiac rhythm groups, and they do like their fancy statistical tests and analysis to try to control for them. Um, <clears throat> they do mention that, <clears throat> excuse me, um, was the follow-up of subjects complete and was the follow-up of subjects long enough? Um, I think for what they were looking, I mean, they had, I think it was complete from what they had. They didn't uh, include any information from people that had incomplete data. Um, it would have been nice to see that past that one month, like what the outcomes were, if they had deterioration, if they had other cardiac events or all these, you know, other things It would have been nice, but um, it would have been nice to have a longer follow-up, but I think it was adequate for what they wanted to to, to look at. Um, what are the results of this study? So again, kind of mentioned before that um, they found that there's an inverse relationship between the duration of CPR to obtain ROS and their outcomes that they were looking at um, in that the initial um, cardiac uh, rhythm group of B, Fib, and BT had the highest survival overall or, and the, the best like neurological outcomes overall as well. Um, they also had kind of statistical differences in their makeup as well. They were younger, had more bystanders and stuff like that. And then what they determined their result was as well was that the critical CPR duration A groups was about 35 minutes. After that, you had you know, um, kind of a um, less than a percent chance of having these like favorable outcomes. And then for the A Sicily group, it was 42 minutes. Um, next is how precise are the results? So, um, I think, I think that they were precise in what the information that they had, like they did, you know, multiple analyses in there to make the determination that the results being significant. Um, I just think there was a lot, it kind of goes back to like the, the next question, which is like, do you believe the results? I mean, I, I believe that based off like their data that they had, that it was accurate, but I think there's still like a lot of factors that are unknown month really bothers me that we don't have any information about that one month what was done in that hospital any kind of interventions that could have these like better neurological outcomes so for us to solely rely on um like the cpr duration for that i think we can't exactly say that um but it's something worth noting um, were the study patients similar to my patients? Um, overall, I don't think so. I mean, the, this was uh, um, done in Japan, and I think compared to St. Louis population, those two populations are extremely different. Uh, not a, like demographics, um, but lifestyle, uh, their ethnic and racial background, like makeups are also very different. Um, and potentially comorbidities. I know that United States has is significantly more obese than the uh, Japanese population. So I mean that could be kind of a factor. Not necessarily be able to like take these results out of this study fit with other available evidence. I think that overall, yes, we do. I, 
other studies have shown that you know, the longer it takes for you to get consistent with kind of whatever studies have shown you kind of our understanding of it. Um, I hadn't seen any other studies though based off of like specific timing because I know different organizations or um, associations have either um, recommendations on like the duration needed to, to get these like favorable outcomes or they don't mention it at all like when when should um when should CPR be um, stopped based off of like low likelihood so yeah that was it any questions questions thoughts from the group I don't know how this would bias it or change it, but if you're only looking at patients that got pre-hospital, like you're excluding anyone who got ROSC in the ER um, and got transported. And so, so, you know, you might have some people that they're close to a hospital, they get work for minutes, they don't get ROSC, and then they get taken to get ROSC. And, or or not, I don't know. So I don't know if bias one way or in another group or whatever. But it's just it's something interesting to think about. Yeah, I mean, that's really good point. They have no information of how. Yeah. Well, and they they name the standard it's the Japanese uh, uh, cardiac arrest standards or whatever. I can't remember exactly what they called it, but we don't really know what that is without going into the depth in their their equivalent. ACLS. So it's hard. You are, you know, outside of 30 miles, whatever, 60 kilometers from a healthcare facility, you stay and play and you don't transport. So it's hard to know really how to compare their treatment out of the hospital. To yeah, what they, they well. eventually have to bring everybody in. Mm -hmm. um, but whether they, you know, yeah, stay and play for five minutes or 20 minutes or what? Yeah. And, and it, this came up as like King County versus this study in the chat a little bit, um, you know, you're talking about King County being a very populated county and that versus they mention it in their, in the paper, but a very mountainous, you know, there's very mountainous remote areas of Japan. So the very different likelihoods of good outcomes there. Japan also, this doesn't really play into this study, I don't think that much, but the, for like the VFib, VTAC mm -hmm. patients, uh, Japan has a crazy ECMO uh, program, or like uh, use of ECMO for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest for uh, persistent VFib or VTAC. So, mm -hmm. and, and what's do, just for comparison's sake, what, do we know what our uh, out-of-hospital cardiac arrest is like pre hospital does anyone have an idea it's poor i don't know the actual numbers but it's pretty poor like, um okay. it might be one to two percent at most it's above zero oh, al but it's nowhere near four percent or whatever you know it, it's it's i think i i i'm not 100 percent sure about those numbers and i also i remember reading somewhere that the japanese don't transport if they don't get ross but that might be just completely a mis missed memory on my part so i think that it changed i did the the year two article and um at least for this article noted that So, and then they didn't get ROSC on everybody. So, yeah, I think Japan they Yeah, just, Japan just started um, promoting termination resuscitation in 2017. So they've only really been doing it really for the past two years because all that was like late 2017. Um, and it's not widespread last time I was reading up on this. As far as the St. Louis numbers go, I'm actually crunching a bunch of numbers um, from our local agencies from 2018. And I won't throw out any numbers yet, but it's not great <laughs> um, compared to the national average. And that's wisdom from Yoda Dog. He is adorable. 
Yeah, and Evan just pointed out, you know, what, what our bystander CPR and witness arrest rates and AED use rates are here um, for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. And I, I'd guess that they're significantly lower than they are in Japan and that that probably has a lot to do with it. So I'm looking at bystander CPR as part of this um, analysis I'm doing, and it is also not good. Yeah. These are the things that we know improve outcomes, and yet we're just not great at doing them. So, so the second article actually, I think, is, uses a lot of this similar data from Japan. Yep. Wait, never mind. There was one from Korea, and there was another one from Japan. I can't remember which one was which. I, I think you're right. I think. Yeah, the second year article is Japan. Yeah, so it actually goes into on scene time from call to on scene, uh, average transport times to and from the hospital. Um, so that that'll whomever is presenting the second article will probably get more into, into those issues. And that's a great segue, Toby, for who is going to be presenting the second year article. Anybody? Hey, hi, it's me, Amanda. Oh, perfect. All right. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, great. Um, it's Amanda. Um, I don't have video because I've got two dogs that are trembling um, in the background from the storm. So if I get distracted, excuse me. Um, yeah. So our article was um, favorable neurological outcomes by early epinephrine administration within 19 minutes after EMF call for out of hospital cardiac arrest patients. Um, it's for 20, it's from 2016. It was um, a nationwide Japanese study done by um, some Japanese uh, doctors, PhDs, EMTs, and then some um, people from Singapore as well. Um, the goal was to look at um, the time dependent effects of um, early epinef uh, administration of epinephrine um, versus late administration of epinephrine. Um, it goes through a, a lot of the same detail that Miro's talked about. Um, they've got a fire base system. They also have an interesting system. Um, it, it's figure one. It basically shows like they have an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. They start CPR. They get a rhythm, and then they'll um, shock if they have a shockable rhythm. If not, they'll continue CPR. Um, they'll see if they can um, get good bag valve mass. And then um, if you're an ELST, which seems an advanced ELST seems to be kind of akin to our paramedic, they've got standing protocols that they're allowed to use. But then um, if they want to do something invasive, if they want to do um, an airway, or um, if they want to give an IV, if they want to administer epi, they need to call med control and get a specific order for it. Um, so it kind of goes through. But this study does, it was, um, the, the article is internally in consistent on whether observational study, um, it says prospective at the beginning and then their conclusion and limitations said it was retrospective. I don't think it probably really matters. It uses the same database that Maros's paper looked at, um, but it looked at um, well, out of hospital it, cardiac arrests between 2006. Yeah. I, I was just going to say this. So it's, what? It's, it's a retrospective analysis of data that was collected prospectively in that database. So they're sort of both right, but really it's a retrospective analysis. Yeah. I was like, it's, it's both fine. Sure. <laughs> um, so um, they're looking at it. Uh, it's an observational study. There was no intervention. Um, the dates that they used was January, 2006 through December, 2012. Um, and they looked at people that had a witness out of uh, hospital cardiac arrest. Um, and then they collected the same data that um, Maros's group um, 
start, they use pe people ages 15 to 89. Um, and there was a note in here that said that families refuse um, advanced, uh, they refuse ACLS on patients that are 90 or older. I didn't quite understand what that meant, whether that was just a generalized cultural thing or whether that was a edict, um, whether that's a standing protocol that they don't, I don't know, but so that they just went up through age 89. Um, and then, <laughs> I mean, yes, it does sound reasonable. Um, and then they, out of the 900,000 plus, they had 119,000 eligible patients. They then looked at those patients um, and divided them into two groups. One was a group of 99,219 that didn't get epi. Um, and then the others was, uh, the other was 20,420 that did receive epi. And they compared the results between those two groups. Um, they looked at um, whether they received ROSC and they also looked at neurological intact survival um, at one month. They used the same uh, CPC standard um, that Maros's paper looked at. Um, and uh, for those, for that um, particular comparison, um, ROSC was initially um, obtained in 18% of the epi group and 9.4% of the non epi group. Um, and then um, favorable neurological outcomes flipped, there was 5.2 in the non-epi group and 2.9 in the epi group. So there were better, you know, comparison. Um, they state that it was, uh, they were significantly different. Um, they don't report the statistics. They don't report a p-value on that for how they determined it. So, um, so then what they did, that was not the, the main goal of the paper. The main goal was then to take the EPI administration group and further subdivide it into um, the timing on when the patients received EPI. Um, they divide it into four different groups. And the paper states that they divided the into four different groups so that they were equally partitioned. Um, so the early group was five minutes to 18 minutes. Um, intermediate, they said, was 19 minutes to 23 minutes. Late um, administration of epi, 24 to 29 minutes. And very late was 30 minutes to 62 minutes. Um, it didn't look like they had any like real clinical purpose. It, they just said that they wanted to make it equally partitioned between the groups. Um, and then they compared um, the outcomes, right, who is getting first epi at 62 minutes? I don't know, somebody in Japan did. Um, yeah. Um, so looking at the, um, the outcomes of that, um, there were um, a greater percentage of ROSC in the very early groups compared, and then the percentage of ROSC um, per group dropped as, you, as they got later and later, which I think we would all think is um, logical. Neurologically intact survival was greater in the very early groups than it was as it um, um, as you became later, that also seems um, understandable. Um, they also collected a lot of um, data on, on these patients. They looked at, but it had to be a bystander witness arrest, and then they collected percentages on whether a family member was a bystander looked at whether there was conventional CPR admi administered, whether there was compression only CPR administered, um, whether there was telephone CPR instruction given. Um, they also looked at um, the initial rhythm, whether it was a VF or VT, 
Um, Japan has a pretty good um, system of placing AEDs um, in public places. So they looked at whether an AED was applied and whether the um, person had um, gotten defibrillated. And then they looked at whether there was a shock by EMT. Um, they then analyzed um, that data and they said that they used a, um, multivariable logistic regression to determine an adjusted odds ratio um, and they said that that was their statistic of um, getting rid of all, all of the getting rid of all of the issues whether it's um, shot ratio of 0.66 with uh, 5.85 and then for neuro neurologically uh, good outcomes of the CPC of one to two. Interesting because they compared themselves to other papers um, that had shown that getting epi um, up to 10 minutes um, after, up to 10 minutes later, um, had good neurological outcomes. Um, and they're comparing this, so there's a couple of there's a couple of issues. One, they're comparing this to the timing of the they have one one nine instead of nine one one. They're comparing this to the time of the one one nine call. Um, so we don't know the amount of time that the person was down prior to the emergency call. Um, so they're just looking at the time of the call to the time of the administration of Epi, um, and they also so they divide these groups into these um, time cohorts based upon like it sounds like the number of people it, the number of patients in the group and not by any clinical standards <clears throat> so for the early group they've got a time period from five minutes to 18 minutes um, we don't know where these good whether the people with a good neurological outcome came in were, you know, were the first five or six minutes, and then everybody after that had poor neurological outcomes. Um, it, there's no um, intergroup analysis to, to determine that. Um, they also don't report a lot of their um, statistical analysis. Um, a lot of the paper just says this was statistically significant or this was um, clinically neg negligible, um, but they don't report p-values for a lot of um, their data points. Um, let's see. Um, and this is, you know, nothing, but they also, like it was, um, a lot of the numbers are, are that they use in the, in the article aren't consistent. Um, they, the numbers that are in the paper conflict with numbers that they report in their tables. So um, I don't know how much I really trust this paper at all. Um, and then there are the limitations that they talked about. Um, it's a lot of the same limitations that Miro's talked about we don't know the comorbidities. We didn't know the time down before the 119 call. Um, we don't have any of the information about what happened while the patient was in the hospital. We don't know about um, the quality um, and consistency of the CPR. Um, they, we don't know a lot about the way that they did the statistical analysis to determine if they were really able to make this, um, that they were really able to say that all of the other issue, all of the other considerations like CPR and timing and bystander CPR 
um, and shocking and initial rhythm were, um, were factored out. Um, and so I don't, I don't love this paper. <laughs> um, so I'll talk through the critical review form for therapy. Um, were the patients randomized? No, it's not a randomized study. It's a, uh, the data was collected prospectively. It's observational study. They, and then they reviewed it retrospectively um, and assigned cohorts. Was the allocation conceal, concealed? No, but um, the patients weren't aware. Again, it's a retro, it's just an observational study. Um, were the patients analyzed in the groups to which they were randomized? Um, yes. Um, were the patients in the treatment and control group similar with respect to known prognostic factors? Um, yes, um, they were, they were um, pretty similar. There's, um, you can compare between the groups um, based upon their, um, the, the patients that got early epi um, tended to have a shorter, um, see uh 119 um call to scene arrival and a scene arrival to the hospital time um and then a 119 call to epi administration um and then with respect to um age um uh, sex um bystander um cpr compression the types of cpr that they received in initial rhythms um, they were pretty. They were pretty similar, but there's no statistical analysis, no p-values to give that. Um, let's see. Where did my sheet go? One moment. Um, were patients aware of the group allocation? No. Were clinicians aware of the group allocations? Uh, yeah, because they were um, assessing, but there was no uh, therapeutic intervention. Were outcome assessors aware of the group allocations? Yes. Was follow-up complete? Um, yes, as, um, as much as um, possible. They did exclude those patients that didn't have um, a CPC at um, a CPC evaluation at one month. Um, we can also talk about um, I just looked up CP that evaluation method. Um, I looked at a couple of papers and it stated that it was found to have um, inter and intra reviewer variability. So it might not be the most, um, it seemed to be more subjective. So it might not be the best way to evaluate it. Um, how large was the treatment effect? Um, we talked about the results um that they got for both the epi to non-epi groups um the epi group had a greater rosc um but poor um neurological outcomes um versus the non-epi group um and then the early to early epi administration to late at epi administration um had a statistically significant um, stati was statistically significant for um, neurologically good outcomes. Um, and then we talked about the confidence intervals as well. Um, were the study patients similar to my patients? This is the exact same that, that Mero said. Um, they're, yes, in that they have out-of-hospital cardiac arrests. No, in that the um, patients are more homogenous in Japan. There's unclear morbidities, um, but we know just from you know general cultural and healthcare differences that it's going to be a very different than our patient uh, group here. Were all clinically important outcomes considered? We talked about CPC and the the reliability of um, CPC. Um, so, and then we looked at ROSC as well. Um, likely treat, treatment benefits worth the potential harm and costs. I think this is like an ongoing conversation about the use of epi. Um, every paper that comes out, people, you know, question, you know, is it even going to be part of ACLS because of um, negative neurological outcomes? So 
it's the current standard. Um, more research, obviously, to be done on it. Um, and then just as a, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily believe that I buy their conclusion. Um, I don't think that they had the, I mean, you, I, maybe, I may be wrong, but I don't think that they had the data to support the conclusion that they drew. So. Yet there seem to be a um, lot of reporting Amanda? issues in the study, like you pointed out, Amanda, that the numbers don't always fix it. I think they said at one point that they had 90,000 subjects and then in the figure and then later on it was 119,000. Yes. <laughs> they wanted to divide the group. 119,000. I was. Yeah. They wanted to divide the groups to create four equally partitioned groups, but then you look at the numbers in each group and they weren't equally partitioned. There were 4,700. They're not equally partitioned. 6,000. Well, but then I was like, well, maybe it's like, because if they added a minute here or there, it would be worse. I don't yeah, know. It was at this maybe. point, I was, I was working on it and Kevin Baumgartner was looking at me and it's at this point that I threw down my pen and I was like, I can't do this. I don't <laughs> like this paper. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, other thoughts and comments? <laughs> yeah, uh, this is Ian. Yeah, I agree with Amanda. I think their reporting on their regression was a little lacking. I mean, they things that we know are beneficial, like early CPR, it doesn't even look like they included a variable for CPR in, in their model, at least based on table three. Um, and there was no clear uh, guidance on how they chose which variable to include and which to exclude, um, which is, is usually done for regression models. Because I, I think the point really is, the, the question to, to answer is, is early epi versus late epi, is adding that variable to the model beneficial beyond things we already know, like early, early time on scene and early CPR? And I don't think they, they didn't really answer that because they just report one model. I mean, they could have they could have answered that by by setting up a couple different models and then adding epi and comparing those two models, but but they didn't do that. Um, so yeah, I, I think their reporting on on the regression is, is a bit lacking, and the and the results um, I, I don't think you can draw the, the clear uh, results from from those models that they made. From my perspective the onset of epi administration is probably just a better proxy for when an actual ambulance arrived, which then likely means better airway, better CPR, defib, all that kind of stuff. So what's interesting about that is that's what I thought it was going to be too, but because of the way that they do their, because of the way that during this time period at least i don't know what it is past 2012 but during this time period at least they showed up and then they could do a couple of things but if they wanted to give an iv if they wanted to give epi if they wanted to give an airway they actually had to make a med control call and get a specific um a specific uh order for that from med control and so if you look at like the time to on scene and the standard deviation for that and then the time to epi the time to epi in those very late epi groups is like 30 to 62 minutes but the average time on scene was much earlier than that yeah the time on scene was earlier than that so, but it doesn't know we don't know what the time on scene was for those late ones right yeah, I mean, like, again, yes. They just give and, you a general average time on scene, they, but, which is like eight minutes. With a, with a, with a standard, right, with the standard deviation. And so, again, yes, of course, like, it could be, like, way later. Um, I don't, it's not great. I don't like this paper. <laughs> the comments? But they are also. Oh. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Amanda. No, I was just going to say because of the because of the way that their system is set up, they um, are going to have all of the the issues that we have with administration of time to administration of epi, like getting a line and you know evaluating the patient and clearing the scene and doing all the things. But they're also going to have to they had to make the call and get the order, so they're going to be there's going to be additional delays. Yeah, good point. 
All right. So yeah, you know, this was the same database as the first paper, but obviously the reporting was very different. Uh, and that's uh, unfortunately it's an important part of, of any research is how you report your research. That's, that's what people see. People don't see all the stuff that goes on behind the scenes. They see what you report. And if, if your reporting is off and suspect, it's going to make people uh, trust your paper a lot less and your research a lot less. So, all right, let's move along to the third year paper. Can, can I uh, hijack the mic for a second? Yes, you can. I just want to say hi to everybody out there who we haven't, you know, all seen each other in the same place for a while. It's Journal Club. Journal Club is a social aspect of our residency program that we're lacking currently. So um, I'm currently enjoying a barrel treasure from Odell. It's a barrel aged stout. Is anybody else uh, enjoying a social beverage of some sort? I found this six mile bridge Irish red ale with honey. There we go. Very All good. right. Can alone is what sold me. Thanks for not making me drink alone, Nico. I've just got food ranger. Boring, but. Ah, there we go. Yeah. Nope, it works. It does the trick. So cheers to everyone. A hazy. IPA. Good choice. I like it. Peach Berlin. Stout from Guinness. It's a peach Berlini Rattler. It's by oh. left hand. It's really good. It's like a summer beer. <laughs> nice. Gr Greenstein, what you were going to tell Doesn't us. Doesn't have to be alcohol, Gaddy. We still love you. <laughs> Dan? Dan, what, what were you going to tell us you got? Dan's probably drinking oh, I'm, drinking, I'm, I'm drinking some Malbec. Fair Courtesy nice. of uh, Al Lula. All right. Well, good to see everyone. And thanks for keeping this going. And thanks for everyone who showed up. All right. We ready for the third years. Move on to me. I've just been ripping shots of Burnett's all day, so that's where I am. Perfect. Um, can I can I share my screen? It's up to you. Uh, yeah, but can you, you can you allow me to? Share? Oh, I, uh, let's see. I don't know how to. I haven't disallowed anybody for sharing. Let's see. I'm on education, so I'm just using a. Uh, Keynote and PowerPoint for. I can ask you to start account. your video. Did that help? Um, oh, there we go. Of, I can use my video. I still can't screen share though. Oh, oh, to share your screen. Shoot. Um, you know, I don't know. Let's see. The easiest have... way to, the fast way to do it is to make him a co-host. Yeah. Okay, that's click, what. I click on the three dots right. next to him. I did it. And make him a co-host. All right, you're a co-host now. All right. Um, this screen. Cool. You guys see my screen? Yes, you're on. Yep. Oh, wow. All right. So, the critical review form of harm, and it's looking at the cumulative partial pressure of arterial oxygen seeing if it's associated with neurologic outcomes, um, seeing what neurologic outcomes are associated with uh, hyperoxia. What they did, oops, let me, next slide maybe, there we go. So the goal of the study was to investigate the relationship between the cumulative partial pressure of arterial oxygen and neurologic outcomes after cardiac arrest. Um, they only included patients with targeted temperature control, because I guess that's what they do for all of their cardiac arrests in the ER. And it was a retrospective analysis of a prospective cohort. The thing that these authors claim that made them kind of unique was that they looked at the cumulative oxygen exposure. They did that by calculating an area under the curve over a 24-hour period using um, PAO2 levels from multiple ABGs with a minimum of four, uh, and then did some sort of integral function by the trapezoidal method that I didn't exactly understand and gave me flashbacks to multivariable calculus, but 
um, if you want to know more about that, you can look at reference 21 in this paper, and it'll take you to a picture like this. And the one that they used was this top one, because I guess in other ICU studies looking at harm associated with different vital signs, this trapezoidal one has been shown to be the most accurate. So, um, the study design itself, they looked at 187 patients who came in uh, with cardiac arrest uh, that received targeted temperature management after the arrest. It was at a large academic tertiary care hospital. And as far as I can tell, everyone received appropriate ACLS care. They looked at um, primary outcome of neurologic status at six months and just said good or bad based on the cerebral performance category. That's the same one that was in neurosis before. And they grouped the patients by outcome rather than exposure. So uh, they had 77 patients who had good outcomes and 110 who had poor outcomes. And their conclusion was that the overall exposure of hyperoxia was higher for patients with poor outcomes with a statistical significance of a cumulative exposure of a PO2 of above 200. Um, they found that this was dose dependent and they found that it was mostly in the uh, time frame of zero to six hours. There was no real significance in how much hyperoxia people were exposed to after the six hour mark. So they found that if you were hyperoxic, hyperoxemic between zero and six hours, you had worse outcomes or if you were hyperoxemic for zero to 24 hours, you had worse outcomes, but there was nothing between six and 24 hours. So they kind of concluded it's the first six hours that really matters here. They evaluated some other variables uh, for their patients. And again, they grouped them by outcome. So they said, what was the median age of the good outcome group and the poor outcome group? They looked at sex, comorbidities, witnessed arrest, bystander CPR, whether the patient had a shockable rhythm, cardiac cause of arrest, time to arrest, kind of things that we've been talking about this whole journal club that are all predictive of whether people will do well or not after a uh, cardiac arrest with ROSC. So getting into the appraisal form, did the experimental and control groups begin study with a similar prognosis? Here I would argue no. This is the baseline characteristics of all their subjects. And again, they're split up by good outcome, poor outcome. And if you look at the factors that are statistically significant over here, basically the good outcome group was younger, healthier, had more witnessed arrests, had more bystander CPR, though that wasn't significant, had more shockable rhythms, had more cardiac causes of arrest, they had less time from collapse to return of spontaneous circulation, and then no real differences between how they were cooled. And you can say that there was a difference in the number of ABGs they got, but I don't think that really matters. So I would argue these patients, their two groups did not have similar, a similar prognosis um, moving forward. So did the experimental and control groups retain a similar prognosis after the study started? So this is kind of asking, did they evaluate the patients in the same way? So did the good outcome, did they look at the good outcome group and the bad outcome group the same way? And I think they were. Uh, both groups underwent the same measurement of neurologic outcome at six months. During the study, the poor outcome group had, as I mentioned, a median number of ABGs of 16, and the good one had a median number of ABGs of 18, but I don't think that really changes anything, and that was the only variable that was different between the two groups. And as far as I can tell, there was no loss to follow-up. So answering the question was follow-up sufficiently complete, I would say yes. Again, they didn't mention anyone lost a follow-up, so I think we just have to assume that nobody was. So before I kind of dive into the results of this study, um, I've no, I haven't really seen many, thing, many studies before that were designed by grouping people based on the outcome rather than an exposure. So this was a little weird for me to interpret, but I think based on how they did it, they did everything appropriately. Um, they tried to account for all of these variables that predict good outcomes like the cardiac cause of arrest or bystander CPR um, with like a complicated logistical regression method that I didn't really understand. 
Um, and it seems like the follow-up was good and they took all comers. So I think overall, at least based on what they were trying to do, the study was designed well. So looking at the results with that in mind. We'll, uh, move forward. This is a pretty messy slide. This was kind of their raw data um, as far as the uh, oxygen levels that the patients were exposed to in both the good and bad outcome groups. And Toby, I'm sorry, I know that you didn't want me to copy and paste any figures from uh, the paper, but I tried to make them as big as I could. So I think the important takeaways here are once you start getting over a PaO2 of 200, as you can see down here at zero to six hours, you start to become statistically significant as far as more good outcomes rather than bad, or uh, sorry, more bad outcomes rather than good. And before that, you don't really see much. And it's the same for 24 hours. Um, there wasn't a whole lot to glean out of single values like the highest PaO2 or the lowest PaO2. The only one that was significant was the highest PaCO2 was associated with worse outcomes, uh, which makes sense. Um, so the conclusions that they drew just based on this raw data is that there seems to be a relative cutoff of a, P a cumulative exposure to hyperoxia with a PaO2 of 200, and everything above that is also bad, as you might expect. This was the statistical method that they did to try and account for the fact that most of their good outcomes, or all of their good outcome patients had other predictors of good outcomes. I don't exactly understand how this works, to be honest, and I apologize for that. Um, the important takeaways here are, you know, they looked at, was the rhythm shockable? Was it witnessed? How long from collapse until ROSC? And you can see, as you would expect, the odds ratio of things that are usually bad for cardiac arrest, like a non-shockable rhythm, has a bad odds ratio that you're not going to do well. Um, and the way that they, I guess, manipulated this data, they were able to show, they were able to change the odds ratios that you can see for the exposure or the area under the curve of the PaO2. Um, so like for 150, you can see the odds ratio of a bad outcome was 1.279. They were able to manipulate this number by somehow incorporating all these uh, numbers into it. Um, like I said, I don't particularly understand it, but I think this is what makes this study a little bit more relevant than if they had just said, uh, just showed us this data here. Um, and the adjusted odds ratios are here. And again, as they concluded, uh, oh crap, I cut some of it off, I'm sorry. Basically, the odds ratios go up as you get exposed to more hyperoxia, indicating that this is a dose-dependent relationship and that you start to see statistical significance at exposures over 200, um, uh, PaO2 of 200 uh, millig milligram millimeters of mercury? Yeah, millimeters of mercury. Um, I'm sorry that I cut this off. It's supposed to have what the actual oxygen levels are over here, but uh, this graph shows it pretty well also. So you can see the odds ratios based on zero to six hour exposure and zero to 24 hour exposure. And the asterisk indicates things that were statistically significant. So can I apply this to my patients? Um, I think we probably can. Um, the data is a little hard to interpret just because of the way that they grouped everybody. And there were so many factors that were predictive of good outcomes and the good outcome group that were statistically significant. But I think it's hard to say that hyperoxia like is the main driver behind why the, why the bad outcome group had bad outcomes, but they did their best to try and account for that. And I think, just given the pathophysiology of reperfusion injuries and other studies that have showed that hyperoxia is bad, I think that you know we can probably apply this to our patients. They took all comers at a big tertiary care center. It's a 1,300 bed hospital, so it's pretty similar to the patients that we're seeing. You know, um, this was done in South Korea, I believe, um, and probably have you know like the other two studies said probably have a better baseline health in our patient population. But I don't think that changes the fact that. You know, we're seeing patients with similar pathology to what they are. 
Um, so overall, I would use this data to say hyperoxia is bad, and I would try to avoid it in my post-cardiac arrest ROSC patients moving forward. That's all I got. I tried to take screenshots of everyone on Zoom and uh, put them on my last slide, but I couldn't, uh, couldn't get everything in there in time. And then I'll post these links that I had um, in the chat. This one, if you really want to know how the trapezoidal method is done, you can click on this one. And this one is a pretty good um, review of why hyperoxia is bad in post cardiac arrest patients. And really what this study was built off of. So I'll put both of those in the in the chat if anyone is so interested in seeing it. And now I need to figure out how to stop sharing my screen. That was good. I can honestly say I think that's the first PowerPoint presentation at Journal Club uh, that I've seen. That was great. Pretty sure this was South Korea. Forward. What's that? Comes from being on education because yeah, I'm making a lot of PowerPoints. Well, good. In keynotes, Jason. <laughs> Um, yeah, this was definitely South Korea. We don't get a lot of research out of North Korea um, published in the literature. Uh, thoughts, comments? More than you know. Kim Jong-un is the first uh, author on all of them. <laughs> well, he's a genius. I mean, I wonder why people had uh, PAO2s over 200 if they're checking them every two hours. And like, is is that is the reason that they had a PAO2 that was elevated in the first place, the reason that they had poor outcomes? Was the attending neglecting them? Were they having uh, ventilatory issues and they were just cranking up the FIO2? Or did they just like not really care because they're like, this person's going to die anyways. So they weren't wasting their time on the vent. Well, I don't think they had individual readings of 200 that was the cumulative effect they were getting so say you had like a level of 100 over two hours i think they were that like adds up to 200 somehow no i don't i don't Those think are not how the numbers work out but that's i mean however regardless of how you do the actual number right they're saying that you're you're at higher doses for longer times Yes. So that means that the physician is letting them do that. And why are they letting them do that is potentially a huge uh, confound confounder. But I also think that, remember, part of the original teaching on MI was, or even cardiac arrest was Mona, where oxygen was the standard therapy. And we found that more isn't always better for oxygen and lots of other realms, as Patrick had mentioned. And when somebody cardiac arrest, normally they get intubated, you put them on 100%, and you leave them on 100% until you get an ABG, you know, 45 minutes or an hour later. And I mean, I know in the ER downtown, that is a fairly, you know, everyone's fairly aggressive about weaning oxygen. I can tell you that in the community, that is not the case at all. And that people spend hours and hours and hours on extremely high levels of oxygen with, you know, glacially slow weeds. Um, and so, yeah, this may seem kind of absurd to us downtown, but when you go to the community, this is, this is, can be kind of revolutionary. The idea that like more oxygen is bad and people should, you should wean oxygen quickly. And I'll just say, I mean, not to say what the standard of care is in North and or South Korea, but 15 years ago, we weren't checking ABGs in the ED. You're like, they're going to get out of here soon enough and we don't need to do it. And we were keeping people on 100% FIO2 when I was a resident, you know, a decade and a half ago forever. They just stayed on it until they went to the ICU. So, you know, it, it might be that they're still practicing in that paradigm or like you said, they're just occupied with other things. Yeah, it does seem odd that they were checking all these uh, ABGs and just didn't seem like they were doing anything with the results. I agree, Mike. Yeah, I mean, even if that standard of care, like, or it's not, maybe then you have younger attendings that are doing a better FIO2. Regardless, there's some difference between the reason that some people have normal FIO2s and some don't. 
whether that's the care that the attending wants to do or that's how much they're paying attention. There's a confounding reason why they have different levels of FiO2 in the first place. Yeah. Other thoughts and or comments on this article? All right, let's move along to our fourth years. Alrighty. Uh, yeah. So, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. All right. Uh, I don't have my beautiful mugshot for the next few minutes. Um, so, my topic or my paper was uh, vasopressors during adult cardiac arrest a systematic review and meta-analysis, which was performed in 2019. So I'm gonna kind of go through some details of the paper, give some of my commentary on some of the stuff, and then quickly go through the meta-analysis form. So this was based on, uh, in the last couple of years about do vasopressors, and in particular epinephrine, do they really do anything? And um, in the last decade, there have been a bunch of studies that have come out on this. Uh, and the International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation basically kind of looked at some of these studies uh, in addition, kind of in the wake of the Paramedic 2 trial, which I think was probably the most recent famous study on vasopressors for cardiac arrest. They kind of wanted to inform their decision making in terms of developing guidelines for management of cardiac arrest patients and in terms of vasopressors. So, um, they kind of did this meta-analysis. So this was a systematic review and meta-analysis, and it basically followed the uh, PRISMA guidelines. Um, what I've learned is, is that acronyms are usually very good, and we should, like, if they ever use an acronym, it's probably very high quality. Um, so this is just kind of like evidence-based guidelines that um, they used in terms of kind of going through all of, all of the papers, uh, and it's, uh, it's been pretty well validated. Um, and then they essentially, uh, in terms of kind of defining their question, um, they used the PICO format, so another uh, acronym, so good, good on them. Um, so basically, uh, their population that they wanted to study was adults greater than 18 years of age uh, in, in hospital or out of hospital cardiac arrest. intervention that they looked at was IVIO, the essentially the, that was also their comparison. They also used placebo control studies that were in, that were in, in the, in the evaluation as well. And they essentially wanted to see um, the effect on outcomes. So the outcomes that they looked at were pretty standard across the board uh, that you've seen in um, some of the other studies. So short-term survival, ROSC rate, survival to hospital admission, they looked at uh, what they call midterm survival, so survival to hospital discharge. And uh, what we care about, I think, what we know to be the, what we value the most are more patient-centered outcomes. So long-term favorable neurological outcomes, they kind of evaluated the uh, CC cerebral performance category and filters or the things that were, that were in study. But uh, Medline, Embase, PubMed, Cochrane Library, all of these seem to be pretty high quality databases. Um, so they basically, uh, you know, had a pair of reviewers who screened all of the papers. They used a, like a Kappa analysis to assess for inner rater reliability in terms of including these, these papers into the study. And they had a third person to kind of be a tiebreaker if there was difficulty in, 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 in. They also uh, used um, what was called the revised uh, Cochrane risk of tool, a bias tool to assess for bias, particularly in the, in the RCs that they had in the study. Um, the studies that they looked at were based trials that, that looked at uh, epi versus placebo, um, vasopressin compared to epinephrine, and epi plus vaso versus epi only. 
um, those were kind of the the big groups that they that they that they kind of evaluated uh, when they did their prisma selection process initially they had like over four thousand um, unique studies that they that they picked up they kind of after going through all of the inclusion process, 37 observational studies that they included. Um, I'm just going to give you a spoiler alert. The observational studies, uh, which included like cohort and case control studies, were overall uh, deemed to be a fairly low quality with high amounts of bias in, in, in most of the studies. Uh, and they didn't really even go too much into the details of the results of those studies to more hone in on the 15 like, you know, control trials that they, that they had. Um, so kind of once they went through that process, they analyzed the data, they kind of assessed all of the different trials for, for bias. Um, in the uh, control trials, overall, they, they said that the bias was probably some concern for bias uh, for most of the studies. Um, but uh, it was, I guess, the best quality in comparison to the observational studies. So in the 15 studies um, they looked at, they kind of broke everything down. Um, when they looked at the studies looking at epinephrine compared to placebo, uh, they essentially they, they essentially found that epi was associated with better short-term outcomes. So when you look at ROSC, survival to hospital, admission, and so forth, when they looked at those parameters, EPI was associated with improved outcomes. Um, they found there was no significant difference in survival to hospital discharge with a favorable neurological outcome between the EPI and placebo control groups. There's only, I believe, like two RCTs in the study that, that uh, looked at that particular setup. Um, one of the caveats with this, and I, and I think, you know, when we looked at the paramedic two trial, when we talked about in journal club, that was kind of the biggest knock on it on using epi was whether or not, you know, there was favorable neurological outcome. Um, the thing about it, though, and what the authors comment in terms of looking at patient centered outcomes like neurological outcome is that a lot of patients don't survive um, to the point where we can even adequately assess for uh, you know, neurological outcome and if it's favorable or not at three months or a year down the road. And therefore, a lot of the studies looking at this are not really sufficiently powered uh, to, to kind of identify any real statistical, um, uh, you know, significance. But they did say in this study, based on what they saw, it trended towards not favorable neurological outcomes with, with epi. Um, the other interesting finding when looking at epi versus placebo was they found significantly improvement uh, in, um, again, early admission and so forth. They found improved outcomes with the uh, epi group compared to placebo when looking specifically at non-shockable rhythm. So this is not your VFib, v, v, you know, your VTVF patients, but your... Um, your asystole PEA patients, they found improved um, survival, again, short-term survival with giving epi. Um, the retrospective cohort studies that they looked at, pretty much they said there was such critical amounts of bias um, in those studies that they didn't really know what to, what to make of, of those studies. But overall, um, lots of uncontrolled confounders and selection bias in those studies. And, um, but they, kind of almost on those studies, it looked like the people who got epi actually did worse in that, in that group. Uh, when you look at vaso compared to epi across the board, uh, there was really no significant difference between groups at any, during, in any of the different categories that they looked at. And same for when they looked at epi plus vaso compared to epi only. Um, really, again, no difference uh, across all the parameters they looked at. And I think that's kind of informs how we practice today, which we don't typically give vaso or combined vaso and epi um, for, for cardiac arrest. Um, I'm just gonna go quickly through the, uh, the form. So did the review explicitly address a sensible question? Uh, I think for the most part, yes. I appreciate that they tried to hone in on specific patient-centered and long-term outcomes. Uh, again, the quality of those the evidence for that is not great based on what they assessed, but 
they did at least try to do that. They also used the, the PICO method, which I think has been shown to be a good method to kind of frame your, your question. Um, so overall, I would say yes. Uh, was this search for relevant studies detailed and exhaustive? I said yes. Again, they used multiple good databases um, to do that. Uh, were the studies of high methodological quality? So it seems to me that uh, a handful of the studies were. Um, a lot of the studies uh, weren't. There was moderate to high concern for bias in, in a bunch of these studies. Um, but, uh, you know, they did use a, a pretty good process using inter-rater, uh, you know, or evaluating for inter-rater dis disagreement um, in terms of how they chose papers or very poor quality. Um, but even then, the ones that they had in the, in the study, there were still obviously limitations. Were the assessments of the included studies reproducible? Um, so one of the things um, that they talked about uh, in the paper was that when you looked at short-term outcomes, so ROSC, uh, survival to hospital admission and so forth, there was a lot of robust data for that and it was pretty um, similar like in all of the studies that they looked at. Variability happens more, I think, when you look at long-term outcome, primarily because patients are lost to follow-up. And again, you know, when you look at neuro and tech survival, a lot of these patients don't, don't really, a lot of them don't survive that long to really get any meaningful data. So the overall results of the study, um, basically epi compared to placebo associated with increased ROSC, survival to hospital admission, high confidence in, in these findings for short-term outcomes across multiple studies. Uh, they had overall mid, overall epi showed to have improved midterm survival, uh, so survival to 30 days, but less robust data for that. Uh, pooled analysis basically, um, you know, overall I think fails to show improvement uh, long term in terms of neurological outcomes. And then vaso and epi, vaso versus epi and the vaso plus epi groups, no real uh, improvement. Um, how precise are the results? So again, uh, I think they're pretty precise when you look at short-term outcomes. So across multiple studies, um, they found similar outcomes, but long-term, not, not as much. Um, how can I best interpret the results to apply them to the care of my patients? Um, I can say that kind of from my personal practice, uh, I have been finding that, um, you know, I, I think I've been shying away more and more from, from using epi, particularly in these patients who are coming in after, you know, receiving four or five rounds of epi uh, in the field. Um, I think, you know, I'm, I've kind of changed my practice to the point that I kind of look for other things to do as opposed to just giving epi. Um, I still think that we need a little bit more data specifically on neurological outcomes, and I'd like to see more kind of robust data specifically for that. But the data to me is trending more towards uh, neurological outcomes are, 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 are poor. Um, were all important patient or were all patient important outcomes considered? I said overall, yes. Uh, I thought they included the things at least that I cared about the most. And um, are the benefits worth the costs and potential risks? Uh, I think this is, you know, an ethical question that I think people will go back and forth and debate, like, should we be giving epi to people who are going to end up at Trizzle and potentially have no meaningful survival? Um, there is a big, you know, cohort of people who believe that, you know, we should continue to do everything. And then there's other people who say that this is not, you know, these are poor outcomes. And, you know, the, in addition to poor, poor long-term survival, there's cost to the healthcare system, Etc. for minimal benefit to patients. So for me personally, um, I don't think that the giving epi, kind of blindly giving epi and high doses of epi is, is kind of worth the cost, but that's kind of a personal thing. That's all I got. Yeah, I think one of the hard areas with these, a lot of the, these studies use a CPC of one to two as a good outcome and three through five is bad. I think three is a bit of a grayer for some people. Um, it's severely disabled, but conscious. And, you know, everyone's got a different opinion on whether a, they would want to be in that condition or whether they would want a loved one to be in that condition. 
Um, if you look at CPCs of three, that may change, you know, might change how epi uh, impacts that outcome. I mean, I think Al raised some interesting points kind of towards the end of his talk of what do we do when people come in after four or five rounds of epi in the field and 20 minutes of 30 minutes of CPR, what are we really looking at for neurological outcome? And I think one of the reasons I like some of these studies is because they kind of give us an idea of what we might be looking at I mean, the duration of CPR study. I mean, once you get beyond 20 minutes, I mean, we're really fighting for like a one in a hundred outcome to get, you know, as time goes on, because once you get below 5% or 4%, I mean, they define their, like overall kind of looking at the studies, they just find futility is less than 1% of a poor outcome. And so is it worth to go from 4% to 3% to do another 15 minutes of CPR and X number of rounds of epi for one in a hundred patients? Um, and I think that's kind of what I was, what I really like about some of these articles is that they may not be the most robust articles, but they give us some idea of what we should be thinking about when patients come in, because by the time they get to us, most patients have 15, 20 minutes of CPR, and three or four rounds of epi already in them. Yeah, and now just to speak to Al's like, uh, where's the harm? Uh, comment, you know, with COVID and other upper respiratory problems as well, like the harm is not just to patient, the harm might be to your team, you know, the continuing CPR and intubation and a resuscitation might mean exposing your team to COVID for 15 or 20 minutes that doesn't need to happen if you're willing to call it when you need to. I think one of the, the other interesting things about this last article is that uh, kind of buried on page 115, um, they talk about changing the neurological outcomes uh, timeline from one month to three months because they've realized that it takes more time to get um, a true neurological outcome, um, which may be nice going forward if that's how they change the guidelines, then maybe research will catch up to that. And everybody will standardize their neurological outcome from one month to three months. Yeah, it's funny because there's actually a, a group that's we, been yeah, we're that. Have an answer. Go ahead, Dan, say that again. Uh, I was saying, are we ever going to have an answer to this question, right? Because the, you, so many people, almost everyone is, dead from this because they come in dead. And then if you get them back, then very few survive. And then very few have good neurologic outcomes. And so like just to figure out a statistical difference between the, like it's, I feel like it's almost impossible. Like every, it's like such splitting hairs in all these studies, right? Of um, to figure out like the true benefit. It uh, seems like a, such a narrow range. Uh, like if it's like, oh, maybe it increases survival by, you know, some sort of minuscule percentage. Um, and it seems like we already have these large, several large uh, patient uh, numbered studies. And like, I don't know if we're ever going to have an answer for this. Like, it seems like you probably get more ROSC and these people do bad. Or am I wrong? I mean, I think the problem is it depends on who, who the study is targeted towards. If it's targeted towards EMS, right? EMS wants, you know, if you look at it, if I get ROSC on somebody and I get them to the hospital, maybe they, do they have a better chance of getting all of the other care that we talked about is not standardized? Will that help them? But once they're in the hospital, what does that mean? Does that make sense? You know, it's kind of, I think it depends on where we are and like the continuum of the arrest and everything else. And I think part of the problem is, is if once they get to the ER, if we think they've got a, a poor neurological outcome based on whatever data we have, then maybe we, is the ER, we should be stopping the resuscitation and not just continuing and looking to get 
only ROSC do we change it to neurological outcomes and hopefully it trickles down all the way through the system that we start focusing on neurological outcomes only. Yeah, I, I want to point yeah, out, I, I think Damaris taped along what you're saying, and you see the other side of this, Toby, you know, compared to just the ED is, uh, what we start in the ED, if we sustain a life that's going to be on a ventilator for two weeks, and if we see a COVID, would crush in the fall or the winter where those vents are a hot commodity. And now we've got, you know, a dozen vents plugged up with cardiac arrests who uh, may not see ventilators who have COVID who might need them. And, you know, that's a, a, a resource that we should think about as part of this, you know, the CRM management tool. Sorry, Brian, I kind of, we stepped on each other there. No, that's okay. I was just going to point out what, what Gary said as well. You know, even, external to the COVID issues, which are going to be a problem for a while. Um, One thing that dead people is resource management. So if, if it's one thing in our ER where you've got backup, you've got people who can come and help you because we've got at least three attendings in the department at any time. If you're out in a single covered center and you're the only doc there and you spend 20 extra minutes in a cardiac arrest uh, patient's room, you may have other patients that need your attention that you're not giving it to, and it's, it's definitely something to consider. I think Gary makes a good point there. Jeff, were you going to say something? Yeah, um, I was wondering if I could show some, some EMS data from my agency from last year from Rock Township that might just kind of show some outcomes that we're kind of headed with, with out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. Yeah, definitely. Go ahead. He's got to make me a co-host for a sec. Hold on. I'm working on it. Working on it. Oh, I'm snowing a Zoom bomb coming. Don't do it, Brian. Don't do it. Too late. Oh. Hey, you know, we're a fellow. He's a, I'm a fellow brew. I'm not going to screw him over. All right. Um... So this data uh, comes from uh, Rock Township Ambulance District, which covers North Jefferson County, um, just south of us. And I took over medical direction there in July. And we've since developed this cardiac arrest registry. We um, hear kind of the breakout of what the, um, the outcomes were. Um, the 85 people didn't have any resuscitation attempted. So that was over 58, just about 58%. 10% or just under 11%, they had an on-scene resuscitation, but that was stopped due to um, either um, medical control order or, um, or predetermined stop points within the protocols. And then 47 per, were transported. Um, so overall, 42, 43% were worked. Uh, 50, uh, just over 58 were, or 57 percent were not. Um, we had 21 admissions uh, to the hospital, and so that was a survival to admission rate of 44 percent. And then of those admissions, 33 were discharged. I have no idea how long they survived afterwards. Um, and then of this, those seven that survived, 100 percent of them had discharge strong neurologic outcomes. So I, I don't have the ability to track. Um, for, you know, one month, three months, nine months, or anything like that. Um, so at least from a short-sighted uh, uh, outcome, we have great neurologic outcomes of the people that we're transporting. The goal really has, has kind of switched in EMS to not transporting dead people. Um, and so you're going to see, if you haven't already noticed, um, when you're more specifically at MOBAP and at Bar and, uh, Barn St. Peter's, you will see very few cardiac arrests and a lot of post arrests because SCAD out in St. Charles County and the West County Fire Departments, as well as a lot of our own WashU EMS agencies, have really embraced the don't transport dead people and only try to transport uh, post arrest patients. So the hope is that in the next few you know years, as this gets taken up, this will this will change to a lot more of our patients have already been siphoned off the top. Um, or a lot of the dead, you know, going to stay dead the whole time are going to be siphoned off and stay at home. Um, and then um, the reason that at Barnes we see a lot is just that 
St. Louis city has not fully embraced the stay at home at stay where you are and leave them there. as well as they do not have mechanical CPR at St. Louis city fire, um, Abbott EMS or at, um, medic one. So all of those patients are getting poor quality, uh, CPR when moving from the scene to the ambulance in the back of the ambulance and from the ambulance to the uh, ED bed. And then we get half quality CPR in the ED that we constantly have to correct the techs and nurses on. So um, it's, it's, it's no surprise that, that we see the outcomes we see at Barnes, but yet when you go out to, to other agencies that transport only the alive patients that they have better outcomes. Are there any EMS places anywhere that don't give Epi? Um, we have, everyone's giving Epi. We're like, I'm starting to consider like the Epi drip uh, that some of the other EMS, more progressive EMS services in the country are trying. It's just a matter of logistics of having pumps and stuff that um, we are, we're working on. So it's kind of a thing to come, but not fully embraced yet. All right, thanks, Jeff. That's uh, interesting. I did not realize that about uh, MOBAP and St. Pete's and West County or um, uh, uh, Christian. All right, any other thoughts and comments on these four articles? Any, uh, any comments to wrap things up? Uh, Dr. Lynch, anything you wanted to add before we finish things up? No, I don't have anything else to add. I wanna thank, uh, Emily and Ian for all their help putting this together and you as well. Yeah, great job guys. This was a, another great critical care roundup uh, sort of talk. Uh, I will send out um, a link for a Google Docs sign-in sheet here as soon as we're done. If you were here, uh, I trust you to actually go in and sign in. And if you were not here, uh, please don't, but you're not listening right now. Um, so thank you guys. Uh, I think this all went pretty well again. We'll probably be doing this for at least a few more months. So hopefully we continue to have good discussions um, despite not being in the same place. So thank you guys and have a good night. Yep. Thanks all. Cheers. Cheers.